Welcome leaders to the eagerly awaited season three of the Leadership on the Rocks podcast. In the midst of the constant demands at work and the responsibilities at home, it's easy to find yourself feeling perpetually stressed out and even guilty, questioning if there's more to life than just this. Well, my friend, the answer is a resounding yes. I'm Bethany Reese, your host and fellow juggler of roles. I'm a wife, mom, educator, entrepreneur, and CEO. In this new season, we're on a mission to guide leaders like you in achieving professional growth without sacrificing the precious harmony of your home and family life. Leadership on the Rocks is more than just a podcast. It's a community. We understand the struggle of feeling constantly busy, exhausted, guilty, stressed, and even anxious. But here's the good news. You don't have to live or work that way. Throughout season three, we're committed to equipping you with the essential leadership skills, empowering you to thrive professionally and personally so that you can make a true positive impact on those that you lead. Whether it's leading your family, a team, or an entire organization, we refuse to settle for a status quo existence in survival mode. So join me as we dive into crucial topics from establishing yourself as a leader rather than a mere manager to overcoming conflicts with coworkers, even building a happy marriage and raising kids and everything in between, because life and leadership aren't lived in isolation. And in this podcast, everything is on the table. Together, we'll share our struggles, lessons learned, and explore essential leadership principles and best practices to be our best selves, both at work and at home. It's time to stop drowning in stress and guilt, and let's move to higher ground by embarking on this journey together. Become the essential leader who builds your life and leadership on the rocks, the essential rocks. Welcome to season three. We as a couple had to be on the same page for that. Um, and we're not perfect. So, you know, we, that's another one you learn as you go, right? It's like, <laughs> uh, oops, my bad. Um, we're not doing that again. Um, so <laughs> yep. <laughs> check, check it as you go. Check it adjust as you go. Yes. This is the Leadership on the Rocks podcast, where we equip and empower leaders like you to thrive in and create harmony between your professional and personal lives. I'm your host, Bethany Reese. And in today's episode, we're going to be talking again with my husband, Jason Reese, for part two about being intentional in leadership within our marriages and our families, with today's focus being on leading our families. To hear all of Jason's bio, feel free to go back to episode 56, but what you need to know about him for this episode is that not only is he an amazing leader professionally, but a great leader for our family. Jason and I have a son in college and a daughter in junior high, and I can't forget our little Havanese dog of joy, Lucius Swanson Reese. Welcome back to the Leadership on the Rocks podcast, Jason. Again, so happy you're here. You are my favorite guest, whom I love the most, of course. So excited to be back. <laughs> yes. All right. So right now we're going to talk about leading our families. And again, we don't have it all figured out. We are not the perfect parents. Just ask our kids. They will definitely tell you that. Um, but we've learned a lot over our 19 years. So let's let's share some of those lessons learned. And again, lots of vulnerability, lots of stories. So I want to start off with story number one, and that was the day that we brought our son Austin home from the hospital. Now, I'm going to tell the backstory. Um, this is early 2000s. I read the book, What to Expect When You're Expecting. I signed up for the emails to tell me about what's happening with my child and you know every single day or every week and how to be a good parent, right? I like structure. Tell me the list. Input equals output. Give me the checklist. I'm going to accomplish it. And then we bring our beautiful baby boy home, night number one, and what happens? We raised a perfectly fine young baby. I don't, <laughs> <laughs> my philosophy may have been a little bit different. I don't think I read the book or got the emails that you got, but um, my philosophy was really simple. Um, people have been raising kids for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Like, this is nothing new. Like, we can handle this. Like, it can't be that hard. It can't mm -hmm. be that complicated, right? So just have a kid and move on and raise yeah. them. But I, the the particular story and um, pain point, right? I get it. Um, that, oh yeah, pain point. That one that one's hung around for a little while. But yeah, so we brought Austin home the first night, and and we didn't have the bassinet mm -hmm. thing or something like that. But we had had this beautiful bedroom, right? Had had his crib thing in there and then we had a twin size bed off to the side right um for 
I have no clue why, but there was a twin. I nurse. That's in why. The, okay. Yeah. For nursing. All right. But there was a bed in there. And so I, I guess you wanted him in the room with us, like yes. in the, I don't know if it was in the bed or. I, like I wanted him crib. in a bassinet in our bedroom. Yeah. And you put your foot down and said, I was, we no. bought a bed. We put together the bed. Parents have been raising kids for thousands of years. He will sleep in his own bed. 20 minute room. How hard could it be? <laughs> And I stood there because you're freaking out. You know, the first time you bring your baby home, you don't have the hospital staff. You're like, how do I know if they're breathing? Now, this is before all those really cool gadgets where you could like put a sock on your baby and they tell you, you know, their their blood pressure. I don't know, all the things, heart monitor. Um, so we didn't have any of those things. And so I I laid our precious son in his crib and I stood at the door and I cried all night long. <laughs> I think they both they both cried all night yeah. long, all night long, <laughs> taking turns. And all I could think about was it. It'll be okay. Yeah. It'll be fine. But I think I got to go to work in the morning. I think we had parental leave at this point. Yeah, so they didn't have parental leave. I was like, I could get called out in the middle of the night for a volunteer firefighter thing. Yeah. And then I have to go to work. It's like, it's time for bed. Yes. So that's how we started our parenting journey with lots and lots of tears. <laughs> but we've learned a lot since then. Uh, again, going back to the marriage episode, we learned a lot about communication, about how to go through conflict and things like that. But as we were raising kids, and this is where, you know, you've got to be in, on the same page, if not in the same book. We've talked about that too. But when it comes to parenting, you really do need to be in the same book. And so I did want to have lots of babies. And Jason was, he's all about structure too. And he's like, nah, I have a five-year plan. So tell him what your five-year well, plan is. Yeah. And I'm okay with more than one kid, right? Mm -hmm. We got two. So obviously I got past that hurdle. Yes. So, but I had a five-year plan for everything. Mm -hmm. We're going to get married. And then five years after that, we'll have our first kid. And then five years after that, you can have another one. And you just continue the five-year mm -hmm. plan. But and, and I am like the girlfriend from my cousin Vinny, but my biological clock is ticking like this. <laughs> you know, so it's another conversation of how many kids to have and when. And so I had Austin at 25 and then we had Ashlyn. I was 30. And after that, I'm like, you know what? I don't want to keep having kids because I don't want to, you know, be a grandma and a mom of a high schooler at the same time. <laughs> So Andy, you just weren't willing to wait another five years. Yeah, that's, that's all exactly it was. It. You just weren't willing to wait another five years. <laughs> oh, man. So we had a son and a daughter. I, I think we had come to the conclusion. We, I do remember us having a dinner and deciding, okay, if our second kid was a boy, that we would be open to having a third pretty quickly um, to see if we could get a girl. But she ended up being a girl, so we stopped it too. Um, so early parenting, again, was trying to figure it out. Again, I'm a reader. Uh, he's a reader too, but... I am, give me the structure, give me the checklist. And he's like, eh, I got the gist. Let's wing it. <laughs> Just wing it. Yeah. That's, that's so, <laughs> so as we're parenting, you know, a lot of things come up. Now, when they're, you know, infants, you're just taking care of them, right? They're not engaging with you so much besides a cute little smile and a laugh and lots of diaper changes. But whenever they start, you know, inserting their opinions of food and how they want to behave or seeing something in a store and throwing a fit, that's when you really got to figure it out of, okay, how are we going to parent these little ones? And so while we may not have been in the same book or started out that way, we really quickly came to the conclusion that we got to have a conversation and we have got to take a stand and be a united partnership and a united front. So these kids don't run our house. And we picked a couple of different categories so can you run us through the categories of what we absolutely had to agree on in our parenting? Yeah. So you started with one, right? Food. Mm -hmm. um, Beth has this sign in the kitchen. It's like you eat what's cooked or there's only one meal. Something. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the sign. It's in there yeah. again. Deep one meal, food. take it or leave it. That's right. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so you eat what's cooked, right? Mm -hmm. So um, dinner was prepared. We're all sitting down at the table as a family. And you will eat it. Yeah. Right? Um, we're not coming back to find something else. So check and adjust, kids. Um, <laughs> eat what is prepared or go to bed hungry. Yeah, you will yeah, be fine. Yeah. Um, and another big one's mm -hmm. always been technology, mm -hmm. right, is is how do you balance that? And and that, again, back to the table of you don't bring it to the table. You're not interacting with it. Um, but then there's a whole another podcast around just technology and family. And it, it's a lot. There's a, so much to unpack mm -hmm. there. But you definitely have to be on the same page on that one yes. because it's it's a messy one and and it changes. At least our experience has been over the, the you know their lifetime. It's different phases. It's different approaches. So yeah. that one's complicated. 
Uh, discipline is another one, right? Of how do you discipline your kid? Mm -hmm. What's appropriate? Um, that's a big one. And then the, the kid activities. So what are they going to be involved in to what level, right? And how mm -hmm. does it, you know, either infringe on your lifestyle or not? It's, and that's a, that's a personal choice that each family has to make, right? But yeah. we as a couple had to be on the same page for that. Um, and we're not perfect. So, you know, we, that's another one you learn as you go, right? It's like, <laughs> Uh, oops, my bad. Um, we're not doing that again. Um, so <laughs> yep. <laughs> check, check it as you go. Check it adjust as you go. Yes. Yeah. I love that. You know, and this just hit me, but I feel like in our, in our marriage and our parenting, but I'm going to talk about parenting specifically. It's like, I can go back to one story, one situation where we made a decision that was the catalyst or, you know, the, the one decision picking a fork in the road and taking it that really changed the trajectory of our parenting. And one of these was, I'm going to go, I'm just going to throw it out there. It's that that baseball or that club sport. And it doesn't have to be baseball. It could be basketball, football, whatever. But it's that club thing that your kid wants to do that I think nowadays is just taking over families. And so our son loved baseball, had friends. We had friends, right? We're hanging out with our friends watching baseball. And when he was seven, it's like, that's when it changed from league to, oh, you, you got to get the private coach. You, you got to join, you know, the the club or the select sport. And then you're going to pay a lot of money. You're going to do a lot of traveling on the weekends. And I remember us having a conversation of saying, whoa, this is not just a tiny decision. This one opportunity is actually a huge decision on which way our parenting and our life is going to go. And I remember us saying like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> I think it took us several discussions to yeah. get to that, though. It wasn't, it wasn't an easy one, right? Because then you also take into consideration the kids' opportunity. Yes. And what does that mean down the road for scholarships? And it, there was a lot to to it, right? Mm -hmm. But but we did. We we ultimately together came up with here's what's important to our family. We'll align it back to our values, mm -hmm. and and we'll anchor on that, right? And you know. Yes. And, you know, I think so as you're like living your life with your kids and as an opportunity comes with your kids, don't just think about it like on a whim. Don't just jump in and make a decision. Think about how is this one decision going to impact multiple decisions down the road? How's it going to impact the family as a whole? And there is no right or wrong. So people who are in club and in select and you've chosen that, that's great. It's a great opportunity for your family. And for those who haven't, that's your decision too. So it's not really a decision's good or bad, it's recognize the power of that one decision and the impact it will have on your family. Um, and so just go in with intentionality of of having that deep, deep conversation. And you're right, it did take us a long time. And, and we chose that our kids' activities will not run our family calendar. They will be active. And that's a requirement we've always had. We're like, we don't care what you do as long as you're active, but your activity will not dominate the family. Mm -hmm the family budget or the family time. And so that was a decision we made. Um, another thing I want to go back to is discipline because this is this can be a, a hard one. And so many times, you know, you mentioned more is, you know, caught than taught. And so often we fight so hard not to become our parents. And then guess what? We become our parents <laughs> for the most part. And so if your parents were a yeller, you're probably a yeller. Um, and it takes a lot of um, heart change for that behavior change to happen. But one of the things that we decided together, you know, that we kind of took a stand on with discipline is we're not going to um, discipline in public per se. Now, don't don't get me wrong. I will snatch your arm and pull you aside um, for that private discussion if need be. But the whole yelling, making a big scene, because that deals with a whole other issue that you're creating is, um, you know, it can really <laughs> offend them because now their 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 pride is hurt. Their heart is hurt for the disciplining. But now, um, you know, kind of how they stand in public with other people, they're embarrassed. And now you have to deal with that. So that was a huge one that we took a stand on. So the teacher and you coming. I out, know. Because I would have just snatched them up. That was my philosophy. Yeah. <laughs> so a lot of these is going to be more heavily influenced by Jason, but the discipline one, I think was probably me with the, the educator background, right? Is you just want to do that in private. You know, you still want to explain the offense. Here's what you've done wrong. Um, and then give them that natural consequence for whatever that is. That's the love and logic for anybody out there who was an educator, love and logic in me there. All right. I want to now talk about the book that we both read 
uh, with a ton of leadership principles from a leadership guru that really impacted the way that we lead our family. And now this book comes from Patrick Lencioni, who is really, he's a guru for organizational health. He writes a ton of books, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team, and a lot of other books about leadership. But he wrote one, and again, you found this book. And then you were like, hey, this is actually a good read. You should read it. And then I read it, and then it just like changed. It's almost like financial peace. So I applaud you for your book selection. You do a good job. <laughs> it's down to the vital few, right? Yeah. I mean, we've read a lot of books that we didn't keep. Right. True. So the, those, oh, true. You, when you build your shelf, right, you, you build it on the final few. So mm -hmm. there's some of them that didn't stick. We yeah. let them go. But three big questions. Patrick Lucioni, like mm -hmm. great leadership guru and yeah. bled that over into the family. You talked about that earlier with the principles, right? They bleed over. Right? Yeah. It's not just a business one. It's family. It's faith. It's it's your your relationship with your spouse. It those big principles stay true across the board. Absolutely. That's another great one. So the book was called The Three Big Questions for a Frantic Family, and it's a leadership fable. So he wrote it in a fable style, and it's really, really great. And essentially what you have, anybody can picture this, is you have a husband and wife with small kids, and their life is just chaos, right? It's just constant chaos. They're both trying to do a career. Their kids are running wild. And here's the essence of the book, is the most important organization you will ever lead is your family. And yet we don't often take time to be intentional in leading our family. We just let things happen. Like we show up at work and we have a plan and we have a goal and we have a vision and we have a structure of systems and processes and we know who we are and what we're doing at work. But then we come home and it's just the opposite. There is no structure. There is no vision, mission, core values of who we are and why we do things the way that we do. And so Lencioni really hits home on Again, the most important organization you will ever lead is your family. So I want you to share with us kind of some big ahas we've got out of this book and how we've applied it to our family. Yeah, no problem. So this one was really a game changer for us on many, many levels. Mm -hmm. But his concepts, Lencioni's concepts, you take it from work, which I re resonated with me, right? I was like, okay, I do this every year at work and I'm planning and executing on goals. But I wasn't doing it as the leader of the family, right? We weren't doing it. It just wasn't there. We would talk about some things, right? Mm -hmm. But we didn't actually sit down, put it on paper, map it out, figure out, hey, what is your mission statement, right? What is your mission statement? So live a life of integrity that is intentional and authentic, right? So we wrote it down and then developed our, our core values, our norms from there. But one of the other things I thought was really great from there, and, and we've kind of instituted this the last couple of years, is kind of almost like a planning retreat, like you would mm -hmm. at an office, right? Let's, let's go off site. We've done that a couple of times. Our kids loved it, actually. No technology. Let's mm -hmm. sit down, spend a weekend together, mapping out, you know, who we are and then what we're going to work on. And then kind of just checking in periodically with each other and being accountable to one another of, hey, here's who, who we are. Here's what our goals are. Yeah. Um, I'm doing this one great. This one I'm not. So mm -hmm. I, for me, that that's been just such a big one for our family as we continue to grow and just learn is putting that structure in place in our personal lives. Oh yeah. I think it's been great. And I don't want to paint a picture that it was like all, all roses, you know, especially now, like we just had our, you know, retreat and uh kind of family goal planning session, uh, yesterday, actually, when we're recording this podcast, and now we have teenagers. So yeah, there's some eye rolls. <laughs> it's okay. But you know what? They still stay involved. Do they want to be doing it? Not so much. But is it going to impact their life forever and ever and ever? Yes, I do believe it is. And it's because it's impacted the way that we interact as a family. And so spending time being intentional of deciding this is who we are as a family. This is what we believe. This is what we value. And this is how we behave. But in that, we also have lots of fun. We um, One treat in particular, we rented an, a house on like Airbnb or something. And it was in Podunk Nowhere, Texas, like cows. And it was an old house. You know, no electronics. We played lots of dominoes. We played <laughs> lots of games and went for walks and hikes and things like that. But it was just such a beautiful time as a family. And we had, I don't even know if you remember this, we had what I would call a Seinfeld episode, the airing of grievances. <laughs> so we established norms to make it safe. And we're like, listen, 
you know, this is not mom and dad telling you who we are as a family. This is us deciding together. I mean, do our votes count a little bit more? Probably. You know, we're not going to say, oh, our mascot is the technology, the iPhone. No. All right. So, but we allowed them to give feedback on our parenting as well, the airing of grievances. And that was, looking back now, it was hilarious. But it gave them the opportunity yeah. to voice. And, and some of it honestly was not too far off. Right? Yeah. There was some feedback that we got. It was like, yeah, okay, all right, mm -hmm. we'll take that. Then we noted yeah. that you I got, that bad. I got to tell one on you. So um, both of our kids agreed that whenever Jason wants something done, like he wants it done now. So stop whatever it is that you're doing. And so that was the feedback. Austin started that. Ashlyn chimed in. And then I was sitting there and I was like, yeah. I feel that way too about you. Like whenever you're like, hey, let's go, you know, mow the lawn or whatever, whatever we do, like a chore as a family, like the way it comes across is stop what you're doing right now. And I'm like, well, I'm in the middle of cooking dinner. I'm not going to stop what I'm doing right now. You're going to have to wait 10 minutes, you know, but that's the story building in our heads because his expectation, well, maybe sometimes it is stop what you're doing, but the <laughs> world revolves around me. That's the expectation, <laughs> right? So I got to take that feedback. It doesn't yep. actually revolve around me. So. Yeah. yeah, it was great. So I really encourage you to be intentional, you know, talking with your your children, coming together as a family and deciding who are we? You know, we know who we are as a Reese family. Our vision is to love, serve and live. And I know that sounds like a, a little sign that you'd probably buy at Kirkland's or whatever, and put it on your wall. But we talk about what that means. You know, we are children of God. We are meant to love God and love others, serve Life is not about us. Exactly what Jason just said. It doesn't revolve around us. We are here to serve other people. And then to live, you know, we don't want our family to get so wrapped up in being productive, I guess, that we don't like enjoy life. So live. And then our mission statement, live a life of integrity that is intentional and authentic. And I love that so much. Live a life of integrity, like do the right thing, live above reproach, be truthful, be honest, all of those things. The intentional part is you can hear it in the in both podcast episodes, the one on marriage and the one on parenting, is don't be a victim of life and circumstances. Like plan ahead. <laughs> be intentional in what you're doing. And then the authentic. And I think I'm I'm kind of proud of the way that we've had these conversations, is you don't have to be like anybody else. God created you in his own image, but he created us all different. And so we we actually sing like a Kenny Chesney song, Be As You Are. <laughs> and so that just releases the pressure of a lot of things. And so, you know, with that, we've defined our core values and we have it and I'll post it on social media. Um, but we have a, a chalkboard in our kitchen that has it all kind of listed out of this is who we are. This is what we believe. And these are the behaviors. People like us. This is what Seth Godin says. People like us do things like this. People like us, the Reese's do things like this. And it's very, very clear. And again, when you're doing this, and especially if you have teenagers, you're going to get the eye rolls. But as you live it out, more is caught than taught. It's going it's going to go in their heart and mind. It, it is. You may not see it on the outside, but I promise you it is. All right. So now let's talk about, we talked about seasons of marriage, right? We talked about, you know, having the littles being business partners and, you know, growing in the stress of career and all those things. But there's also seasons of parenting. and Jason, what do you think some of those seasons are? Can you kind of tell us like where, what, what, in your experience, what are some seasons of parenting? Well, so we started with the story of, of Austin coming home. So you have the littles, right? Yeah. Which you're the caretaker. You're the one that you're beholden to them 24 hours a day, right? Like mm -hmm. that is your job and, and you, you take care of them, right? You nurture them. And then as they get a little bit older, then you become the teacher, right? And you're in putting wisdom out there and upon them. Mm -hmm. Then you move into the kind of the counselor phase, right? Of, you know, here's how it's going to work. Here's some opportunities. Here's what you can do. Um, I don't know. What do you I, think? How yeah, are you feeling right now? You know, put your, put your uh, <laughs> educational cap yeah. on at that point, right? You're becoming a counselor. Mm -hmm. um, and then you move into kind of a coach mode. So as um, we're at this point now with Austin, that he's in his freshman year in college, you know, we're, we're in this later phase now with him. So um, mm -hmm. he probably thinks he's out and on his own, but we still have a role. We have still have a responsibility mm -hmm. to him at this point, but you move more into that coach um, and advisor type mm -hmm. role as they get older. Um, and then hopefully these kind of key principles that we've been trying to instill for 18 years, you, you release them to the wild and, you know, hopefully they turn out. Okay. Right. Yeah. I don't know. We'll find out. 
<laughs> as we know, but but hopefully those those principles have stuck with them, mm-hmm. and, and we've been intentional enough that the more that's caught and that's taught, right, that they catch that and they mm-hmm. take it with them into yeah. their next phase of life. Yeah, and I think it's really important just to, uh, being able to identify the season of marriage that you're in, identifying the season of parenting that you're in, because you need to change hats. You know, as the teacher, you're providing the structure. You're do this, don't do this. You know, a lot of hands on um, structure in their lives. And then as the counselor, you're, you're, once you put on that hat, you're more of a, well, what do you think? What do you think's happening? What do you think you should do? It's asking a lot of questions to see if all that teaching, all that direct instruction turns into, they have understanding that they can apply in their own situations. And then the coach is very much of you're out playing the game, right? And Austin's out playing the game. And whenever he was a junior and senior, you're still coaching and it's like, okay, your butt's on the bench. <laughs> like that was a bad decision. <laughs> but, you know, as he, again, he's a freshman in college. So there's still that element of coaching because he's experiencing things he's never done before. Um, but we're not benching him so much because he's living on his own. But then I think in next year, it's it's truly that advisor role of, I don't know, what are you going to do? Like a hundred percent, this is your life. You're living it. What is your decision? And then giving him advice for that. And so like our daughter, she's in junior high and I think it's a lot of counselor. And as she gets into high school, it'll, it'll be more of that coaching role, but recognize the season that you're in and switch, switch the hats when you need to. And sometimes you do need to be two roles. Um, And I think, especially in junior high with that counselor role, oh man, I heard somebody say it this one time and I cannot take credit, but they're like, your kids are out. Let's say they're out playing tag and it's just exhausting. And they're out trying to figure out who they are, what their social dynamics are, all of these things and all of these stresses that they have and and add to that the element of technology and social media and, and never having safety. You need to create a home base where they can come, you know, base like in tag where you can catch your breath and then get a plan, right? Help them find the base where they can feel safe create the plan on how they're going to go out back into the game. And so uh, again, I can't take credit. Lord knows where I heard that years and years ago, but it was great. <laughs> so thank you to whoever said that, but. Um, it's probably me. <laughs> can't take credit for that. You know, I'm sorry. Continue on with your story. <laughs> oh, you're so funny. But so let's, let's talk about probably one of the hardest seasons of parenting. Dun, dun, dun. Let's, teenagers. teenagers. <laughs> let's talk about teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, skip that part. No, and then pop out the other side. It will test every every fiber of your being as a parent whenever you raise teenagers. So I want to talk about number one. Um, we heard again. We we referenced Dave Lin- Dave Ramsey a lot, but we we listen to a lot of his podcasts on all those road trips, and he tells a story about the rope with his children, and we have totally taken it, made it our own, and have raised our children with the rope story when it comes to freedom and responsibility. So, so you, you can ask them, of, of, do you know the rope? Do you know how far out it is? Mm-hmm. And they will know exactly what you're mm-hmm. talking about. Yeah. Of uh, You know, they have a rope and it's attached to them, right? And then we, as they make good decisions, mm-hmm. right? We let it out, give them more freedom to operate. But as they make poor decisions, we pull them back in, right? Mm-hmm. So the rope has slack or no slack, depending on um, how well they are kind of performing, if I... Did yep. I characterize that? Exactly? Oh, you did perfectly. Okay. Absolutely. You know, and again, whenever we're like, hmm, where are we at with the rope? Like whenever they're talking about a situation or they've made a decision or they, you know, they're asking to go somewhere, right? Mm-hmm. Going alone, especially. We're like, hmm, where are we at with the rope? And they will immediately roll their eyes and we're like, no, we're serious. Let's think about this. What decisions have you been making that shows responsibility that that is helping us to decide whether or not you get the freedom, Right. And so it's a great analogy. And I think when it comes to parenting, you want to have like a third party story or a thing or a visual that you can point to that helps gauge decision making and and the process of where they're at in their freedom and responsibility. So for us, we use the rope story. You can find something on your own, but definitely find a story or a visual of something that you can use to, to anchor your parenting on. I think it's very helpful. All right. I want to talk about a question that I ask a lot, and it's mainly talking with you about parenting. As situations arise in parenting, and they're going to, when your kids start being social and, again, want to go out with just friends, want to go to parties, want to date, all those things. And when they get caught, 
and or let's say they have bad grades or they get caught doing something that you wish they wouldn't. A lot of times I will go to Jason with this question. This is how I feel. And it's usually a very raw response. And again, this is to him privately. Ah, this is how I feel. And this is what I want to do. Will this cause them ther therapy later in life? <laughs> it's a good measuring stick, right? <laughs> Will this cause them therapy later? Yeah. Yeah. So I like that one. I, I like that we come together with the raw feelings and we hash that out between us two because our kids don't need our raw family feelings, you know. Um, with technology, guys, as a previous educator, I gotta tell you, as soon as you give your kid a piece of technology, you, you know, you're pretty much giving them access to, to pornography and things like that. And so there's just a lot of things that you don't think you have to deal with that you end up dealing with. And so You've got to hash out with your spouse, hey, how are we going to handle this? But do that in private. Don't You don't have to react right in the middle of that situation. Unless safety is involved, then obviously there needs to be a physical reaction for safety. But if safety is not an issue, like take time to process and be like, you know, this is the situation. I'm going to talk to your dad. I'm going to talk to your mom. We're going to take time and we'll come back and talk about this because you don't want that a big emotional reaction um, because oftentimes you will overreact. Would you agree with that? Always. Yeah. 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 Take time to process it. Think yeah. through your options, mm -hmm. right? Because how you respond to your kid, yeah. um, it's going to have a really big impact on how they come back to you that second time, right? Because mm -hmm. they'll make a mistake again. So how you react that first time is really going to help them decide, oh, do I want to go back and talk to dad about this again? Yeah. You know? He reacted so badly and blew up in my face. I don't think I ever want to tell him anything again. Right. Ultimately, you want to capture your kid's heart, but then you also want them to understand, again, who we are as a family, how we behave, what's acceptable, what's not, and natural consequences of things. You know, there's going to be a lot of good and mostly bad natural consequences of de teenager decisions. <laughs> um, and, and you have to let them have the natural consequences, yeah. right? I'm not here to come in and save the day and helicopter parent in, oh, whatever yes. that is, right? But there's natural consequences. And so you you have to own those, right? Mm -hmm. You made the decision. I'm here to help, right? Yeah. But not to remove obstacles out I'm of your way. I'm so glad you brought that up. You know, uh, being in an education, there's the helicopter parent. They come in and save their kids from all hardships. So whenever they, they hit a wall, the parent will come in and save them so they don't experience consequences. But then, and I don't even know if you know this, but there's a new type of parent called the lawnmower parent that comes in and they actually go ahead of their kid and mow down all the obstacles. So their kid never actually has an obstacle. And that doesn't set your kids up for success in life. You know, it's all about, remember you're coaching. They're the ones playing the game. They've got to experience, they got to get a few bumps and bruises and hit a few obstacles, but then you coach them how to get through it, around it, over it, you know, all those things without those opportunities, you don't get an opportunity to coach. And then you send them out on their own as an adult and they have no idea what to do. And so don't do that for your kids. Coach them I, through it. I would make a terrible lawnmower parent. Like, it, I expect my kids to mow the lawn. Like, I'm not the lawnmower parent. But it's, it's, that one's not working here. <laughs> oh, that, that's, that's a good point. All right. So as we have transitioned into parenting teenagers, <clears throat> I have learned, and, and I, I kind of know this, but I also am a daughter of my father who loves to lecture. So one thing that I'm learning and that Jason helps me remember is to be short and be concise. And so one of the things that we've done in parenting, especially with teenagers, is we don't lecture. We summarize things into very short statements. So we have six statements in total that we tell our kids. So, but they're grouped in pairs of three or not pairs, but three groups of three. So the three things we want for your life, will you please share those? Yeah, yes, I will share the pairs of three. Yeah. I like the way you laid that out. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the three things that we do for for your life, right? As, as our child, we would number one, want you to love Jesus, right? Right out the gate. Um, don't marry a crazy person. Sounds funny <laughs> to say that out loud, uh, but be intentional. Again, we hear the word intentional, right? Uh, be intentional of who you date, and, and because if ultimately that's going to how you select who you marry. So mm -hmm. don't marry a crazy person. And the third one, pay your bills. Mm -hmm. That's the three. So love yeah. Jesus, don't marry a crazy person, pay your bills. 
Um, it, we even kind of throw a joke sometimes with Austin on the third one of, of pay your bills. And then we it, legally, right. Uh, j- just to make sure he he is very clear about what we're, yeah. our expectations are. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the other, the other set of three is, is what, what could derail your life? Right. And there, there are big things that could happen to you that mm-hmm. um, it's not, you can't recover from them. Right. Cause we all make mistakes and have second opportunities, but they will take you down some paths that, that will be a little harder than you need it to, right? Mm-hmm. So um, doing drugs, um, I sound, I feel like I'm a 90s commercial. I don't do drugs. You yeah. get a little fried egg on top. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> but, this is your brain. This is your brain on drugs. Yeah, yeah <laughs> that one. Don't do drugs, kids. Um, <laughs> that's one of them. Yes. Uh, drinking and driving is another one, right? Those uh, could have potential life-changing uh, situations for you and others. And then having a baby out of wedlock, you know, premarital, um, things like that, just make it more difficult. Right. Mm -hmm. So again, it's not that you can't overcome them, but those are three that that we look at, right. Just try to avoid these if if possible. Right. So that's our two sets of three. Yes. Two sets of three. Thank you. Oh, so again, the, the older they get with the teenagers, just try to make it very simple because lecturing does not work. (laughs) They won't listen per se more is caught than taught. All right. And I love, you brought this up earlier as we were just talking about this episode. Will you talk about grace because you said it so beautifully? Yeah. So this is prep. So I have to remember what, what I said. (laughs) Um, but, but if you think about it, all these mistakes that could be made, um, a lot of them will be made by our children, right? We made a lot of these same mistakes Mm -hmm. ourselves. So how do you bring grace into the equation? And like you were talking about, it can be hard in the moment, right? When when you're the little red guy and the stuff shooting out of your head yeah, and like the emotional guy, um, it can be hard, right? To kind of rein that back in, but you, your your children are going to need grace, right? Mm-hmm. They're going to make some bad choices. Um, hopefully you, you've helped them avoid some of the bigger ones, but um, this, when they do make the bad choices, it, it's, you're not a bad parent, Right. It mm-hmm. don't that's not a personal indictment of you. Um, it is kind of a reflection of us, but <laughs> but you just don't don't take that as as you failed as a parent. It's it's a choice that was made and then there's natural consequences. We're here to help, coach, advise through it as mm-hmm. we go, but have some grace in the situation for them and for for yourself. Yes, for sure. Yes. Whenever your kids make mistakes, it doesn't mean you suck. <laughs> It doesn't mean they suck, right? I love that. Um, Have grace. All right. So we've talked about parenting and and we've talked about several things. And as we come to a close, what are some key takeaways our listeners need to grow in and apply when it comes to parenting? So how would you kind of summarize all this, put a little bow on it? What do we need to know? It's a big topic to put a bow on. Oh, I know. Um, But I I guess for me, I'll go back to same principles we were talking about with, with marriage, right? It's being intentional. Be intentional about the time you spend with your family, about the, you know, principles that you put in place. Have have those conversations Mm -hmm. on the front end of here's who we are. Here's why we do the things we do. Here's the expectations. Um, That is, to me, one of the big, big takeaways for us as a family that that we're just trying to share here, right, Is, is be intentional. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I want to add to that, you know, as you're being intentional and having all those conversations, write it down. Um, you know, we, we've talked so much on this podcast about the knowing doing gap of, well, we've, we said it, I said it that one time back in that one conversation, you know, six months ago, don't you remember? <laughs> There's something to be said on having a visual. And so write it down, whatever it is you and your family decide that's important to you, write it down and then talk about it and model it and point back to it. Um, I, I think it's in Deuteronomy chapter six. Um, you know, it's the Shema prayer. Uh, I don't know exactly how to say that, but it says impress upon your children, you know, talk about it when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up and you've, you know, impress. And I heard this one time, I heard a preacher say this one time, and it has impacted me so much with parenting. Impress upon your children is a terminology from like, pottery, like the people that used to mold things and clay and all that sculptures and stuff. And impress means to, you know, tap it in over and over and over again. That's how they sculpt things. 
it's hitting it over and over again. And I want to be very careful using that hit word because I don't want, want you to hit your children. That's not what I mean. But it's to tap it in over and over and over again. And that's what our children need. They need consistency in we can't say things one time and expect that they heard it, understood it, and can apply it to their lives. You know, children, number one, are probably not going to hear it until eight times. I think that's actually, Donald Miller says, you know, it takes the human eight times of hearing something before they actually understand it and, you know, like truly listen to it. But impress upon your children. So repeat it over and over and over again. Don't get tired. And I know it's so easy for us to get tired of saying, oh, I've told you once, I've told you a million times, but impress upon your children is what the Bible says. So, all right, now let's talk about a poor decision. So what is one poor decision you would warn our parents to avoid Mm. when it comes to leadership? Poor decision number one is do as I say, not as I do, Oh, right? So uh, yeah, that's just kind of pointing fingers backwards, right? So uh, this one's not actually pointing towards the children. It's actually back at us as parents, right? So Mm -hmm. um, it's more is caught than taught, right? Is That's the, the simple phrase for it that kind of resonate, resonates with me. But parenting is, is not about telling your kids how to do something and why they have to do it, right? It's mm-hmm. show them, model the behavior that you want to see in your children. They will catch it mm-hmm. and, and, and you'll see it. May not in the moment, but for me, that's, that's the big poor decision for a parent, right? It's just do it because I said so. Mm-hmm. And I'll I'll own that one. I know it's come out of my mouth several times, <laughs> several times. But that goes back to grace. You know, we're all we're all in the progress of getting better. Perfection is never possible, but progress always is. So better today than I was yesterday, and that includes in parenting. Well, Jason, thank you so much for being here again. I adore you, and I'm just so thankful. And I love doing this life with you. And, you know, it's easy to say you're my favorite podcast guest. Oh, well, <laughs> we'll see how your brick you need to go when you see mine. But uh, I was excited to be here and, and talk about our family and, and mm-hmm. our marriage. So it's uh, it's important as a leader, right, just of the family, mm-hmm. that that's my responsibility. Um, and glad to come alongside you and do life together. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right, guys. Well, until next time, continue putting in the work of building your life and leadership on the rocks, the essential rocks. God bless. Remember, the most essential rock you can build your life and leadership on is the rock of Jesus Christ. Today's Bible verse comes from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them.